Hey guys. So we have um, a lesson today that I, I think is pretty interesting. It's, you know, we're right off the heels of sequences and series and things like that. Um, this doesn't really tie in too much to that. This kind of leads into probability. And so it's kind of its own little lesson. Um, I find this stuff extremely interesting. Uh, it's one of my favorite branches of mathematics. It's not so much algebra uh, as it is its own kind of entity. Um, you know, I took a, it's actually two semesters worth of college. It was called discrete math. I had a semester, it was called discrete one. And then I had a semester, it was called discrete two. And this is a lot of the stuff that we got into. Um, and, you know, we're going to scratch the surface just a little bit. Same with probability. But there's so much that goes into this stuff that I think it's just kind of cool to show you guys kind of the beginnings of it. You know, I mentioned um, how last time um, I just lost my train of thought. I forget what I was going to say. Oh, we're going to talk about how many ways things can happen. You know, I, I alluded to a horse race last time, uh, and you'll see an example like that here in example four. Um, this is one of those lessons where some students pick it up really, really quickly. Uh, some students struggle a little bit, and that's okay. Uh, you'll get some practice in the assignment and things, and, um, and it's okay if you struggle, but I think it's, it's good to be exposed to it. Your calculator is going to do most of the work. You're not going to have to do hardly any computation or work or anything like that. Um, but I would have your calculator out and ready because your calculator is going to do quite a bit of the stuff for you. You're going to have the, the thinking is what do you have to type into the calculator? And then your calculator pretty much does all the rest. So that's where the thinking comes in is what do I need to put in here? Okay. Um, so first and foremost, before we just jump into the lesson, I want to uh, really briefly just talk about factorial and what it means. And I think this may have come up in class, you know, once or twice, someone brought it up, maybe, I don't know. But, you know, if you see this six with an exclamation point or any number with an exclamation point, it, it doesn't mean six, you know, it means six factorial. Really what it is, it's an operation. This is asking you to multiply six times five times four, times three, times two, times one. Factorial basically means multiply every consecutive number in decreasing order all the way down to one. Now, this wouldn't be too tough to punch into your calculator, right? Six times five times four times three times two times one. That wouldn't take very long. But, you know, if I asked you to do like 18 factorial, um, you're not going to want to do that. And, you know, 18 times 17 and so on. So there is, first of all, a button in your calculator that does factorial for you. So let's say I wanted to do six factorial. So I push six, and this is just where you might want to have your calculator out so you know where to push the buttons and stuff. I go to my math menu right here, which is where we spent most of our time this year. I'm going to scroll over to where it says PRB, which stands for probability, because that's what we're going to be getting into. And you'll see option four is the factorial sign. So right there, that's going to do six times five times four times three times two times one. Push enter, it gives you 720. The reason I wanted to talk about what it means and where to find it is because some of the stuff in the lesson today revolves around factorial. Um, if you choose, you know, that route in doing the problem. So it's just something to have in the back of your mind. Okay. So there are three things we're going to talk about today. Counting principle, permutations, and combinations. And what these three things do is they find how many different ways can, can you do things, essentially. You know, I mentioned in probability how the bottom of your fraction in probability is always what are the possible number of ways that something can occur? And then we'll get into that next lesson. But this is finding that. The first thing we'll talk about is counting principle. Now, you guys already have some exposure to the counting principle, whether you know it or not. You know, in middle school, they give you those questions where it's like, you go to your closet, you have three shirts that you can choose from, you have four pairs of pants, and you have two pairs of shoes, right? And then it says, how many different outfit combinations can you make? Well, what I've learned in the past from talking to students is your teachers have had you guys make like trees to do this for some of you. You know, you have your, your three different shirts, 
right? And then for each shirt, you have four different pant combinations and you branch that off. But you're not going to have to do this because what if these numbers were like 7 and 15 and, and 34? You know, you don't want to make trees. So I'm going to show you guys the, the quickest way to do this. Some of you may already know is you just multiply these three numbers together. If you want to figure out how many outfit combinations, do three times four times two. I think some of you know that already, but just in case you didn't, that's the quickest way to do it. There's 24 outfit combinations. Well, that leads into this first question. It says, how many different combinations of six digit license plates can be made when the first three spaces are numbers, the last three spaces are letters, and the last letter can't be Z? Well, a lot of times for these types of problems, I think about these as, okay, I want to figure out how many ways can I fill in these six spaces of the license plate, right? We have this license plate. There are six different uh, spaces that we need to fill in. And now I need to think about how many different ways can I fill in each of these spaces. And then once I figure out how many ways can I fill in these spaces, I just multiply the numbers together. So it says the first three spaces are numbers. So that means it could be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Well, if you count all those, that's 10 different options you have to plug in for that first space. So 10. I can fill in that first space with a 0 through 9. That's 10 possibilities. Well, the second space is a number. So I have 10 ways I can fill that in. And the third space is a number. So 10 ways. It says the last three spaces are letters and the last letter can't be Z. Well, that means I could fill this in with 26 options. Same thing here. And if the last letter can't be Z, that means I have 25 options to choose from. So I just think about how many ways can I fill in these blanks. And then once I do that, I just multiply all these numbers together. And that tells me the number of different license plates you can create. And that turns out to be 16,900,000 uh, different license plate combinations that can be created. All right, example two, a combination lock will open when the right choice of three numbers from one to 40 inclusive is selected. Inclusive means it could be one or 40. How many different lock combinations are possible? Well, again, I'm, I'm thinking how many ways can I fill in the three spots of the combo? Well, I have 40 numbers that the first number could be. It could be anywhere from one to 40. The second one, I have 40 options as well. And the third one, I have 40 options. Multiply those together, and you get 64,000 different possible combinations. Now, sometimes the question will say, the numbers can't repeat. Now, this is important because what that means is, you know, whatever number this is, let's say the first uh, number is a 7. Well, that means that 7 can't appear in either one of these spaces. Well, let's think about how we would approach that. If it said numbers can't repeat or no repetition allowed or something like that, well, think about what that would mean. And this is going to start leading into permutations and things like that. Well, that first space, I still have 40 options, right? I have 40 numbers available that I can have that first digit be. But whatever digit this is, I can no longer use for this number. That means now I only have 39 possible ways to fill that in. And then whatever number I put here, well, now I have two numbers that I can't use for this. That means there's 38 possibilities for this space. So I had 40 options for this one, then 39, then 38. Multiply those together, and then you'd get your answer. And so you can see where factorial can start to come into play is a lot of times if you say no repetition, well, now your numbers are going to be descending order like this. Okay. So the next one is called permutations. Now I will say that these are very similar. We can treat these two types of problems in a very similar manner. There's going to be a formula I'm going to show you. You don't really need to know the formula because your calculator is going to do pretty much all the work anyway, which I'll show you. Okay. So um, example three says, how many ways can five children posing for a photographer line up in a row? So it's very it's it's tougher to do this in a video than being in class. Because in class, I'll pull up groups of students and kind of arrange and things like that and give you guys a, a visual sense. But imagine there's five of you, and they're going to line you up in a row. 
Okay, well, let's think about how many different ways we can fill in these spaces. There's five kids over here, Johnny, Billy, Megan, Tommy, and Joe, all right? And how many ways can I put a person here? Well, I have five people to choose from, right? There are five different people I could put in that space. Well, whichever one of those five people I put here, I can no longer put them in this spot. So that means there would be four people that I could fill in that space with. Well, if Tommy went here and Joe went here, well, now there's only three people left I could fill in with this blank. And then there's two, and then there's one person left over. And you, again, you could see that factorial effect taking place here. It's really just five factorial. And so if we're going to have, you know, however, they say n elements. In this case, that's five children. So five is the n, and elements are the children, just the things that you're, you're arranging. That would just be n factorial. But let's say that we have a large group and we want to order just a subgroup of them. So it says permutation of n elements taken r at a time. Here's what I mean by that. It says there's eight horses running in a race. Clip clop, clip clop, clip clop. In how many different ways can these horses come in first, second, and third place? And then assume there's no ties. Okay, so n elements. That would be eight. There are eight total horses in this race. We are going to order R of them. That would be first, second, and third. That means three of these horses we are going to select and arrange. So eight would be the N, three would be the R. R is always less than uh, or equal to N. Well, the formula, which you're not really gonna have to use, but I, I do think it's my duty to, to talk through, is N factorial. Divided by, and then it's n minus r, whatever that is, factorial. And I'll show you why here in a second where this formula takes shape. Okay, so there are actually three different ways you guys can do this problem. Anytime we're talking about order mattering, so first, second, third place, um, you know, you look down here at this example, we're going to have a president, a vice president, a secretary, and a treasurer. So the order matters, like it matters who's president, who's vice president, and so on. It matters who's first place, second place, third place. That's what it means by order matters. Anytime you're doing a problem like this, you can treat it like a counting principle problem in terms of filling in blanks. I'm going to show you what I mean by that. So we have this podium, right? These horses are going to come in first, second, and third. So we have this podium right here. We have first place, second place, third place. Well, let's think about how many different ways we can get a first place winner. There's eight horses, which means there are eight ways, eight different horses that could finish in first place. One of those horses is going to get first place. I don't know which one, but one of them is. Well, that means that there's only seven possible ways that a horse can finish in second place. Because whoever got first, obviously they can't finish in second. So now there's seven ways that they can finish in second. Well, whatever horse got first and then second, those two horses can't finish third. And so there are six possible ways those horses could finish. We would multiply those together, and we would get 336. So that's option one, is you just treat it like you're filling in spaces of a podium, and you treat it like a counting principle problem. Here's option two. We can use the formula that I just showed you. So if we have eight horses, that would be eight factorial on top. And then if r is 3, well, that means we have 8 minus 3, so 5 factorial on bottom. And then I want you to look what happens if you could do this in the calculator, but I want you to look at how we can simplify this. When I took this class in college, it was, it was pretty much all non-calculator, so we would have to do all this, you know, mental math. Well, here's how factorials work. It's kind of cool. 8 factorial, you don't have to write this, but I think it's good to see is 8 times all the way down to 1. 5 factorial is 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. And we can cancel out all the common factors. Like the 5 through 1 all go away. And these are the kind of strategies and tricks we would have to do in that class with no calculator. And notice that you just end up with 8 times 7 times 6, which is what we just did over here anyway.
The third way is the one that students choose to use more than the other two, and that's using the calculator. So this is the last one that I want to talk about. So in your calculator, if you push math and you go over to probability, you're going to notice two different options here. Look at option two and three. One says NPR, one says NCR. Well, we're doing permutations and combinations for the most part in the rest of the lesson. This NPR is a permutation problem. That's when the order matters. NCR is a combination problem, which I'll get to, but that's when the order in which you select things doesn't matter, which I'll explain. Well, this we're doing a permutation, and so I want you to look at how we can do this in the calculator, okay? Depending on your calculator, on mine, I push this button first. Oops. Maybe I don't. On some, you do. Right, so check your calculator. If you push the button first, sometimes... I don't know why it keeps giving me answer. I don't want that. I'm not sure why it's putting the answer there. I don't like that. So on my calculator, here's what I have to do. I push 8. Then I push NPR. And then I do th uh, 3. So I have eight horses, and I want to know how many different ways can I arrange three of them in first, second, and third. And I push enter, and it gives me the answer. All you would have to do on your paper for work, so there's that NPR button, you would just need to do 8P3. That's the only work I would need to see, and then equals 336 right there. That's all I would have to see. So some of you, when you push that button, it's going to give little boxes where the N and the R are, and you just fill them in. So it depends on the type of calculator that you have. So those are your three different options of doing these problems. And I don't, I don't mind how you guys do it. Any are fine. Okay. The last type of permutation problem, and then we'll jump to the last uh, couple examples for, for combinations. This one's a little different. It's kind of, it's kind of formulaic uh, in a way. And let me read the question. It says, find the number, that should say of, of distinguishable permutations of the word Mississippi. Basically what this means is, how many different ways can I arrange all these letters so that it visibly looks different? When it says distinguishable, like it looks different. And here's what I mean. So I, I want you to look at this word. I want you to look at this S and this S right here. Look at these two S's, okay? Now I want you to close your eyes. Close them. Close them. Okay, they're closed. Okay, open them. Did I switch these two S's? Did I move them around? Did I take this one and put it here and, and then switch them? Well, I don't know, right? It does, This doesn't, I did actually, I, I switched them. You didn't see me because I had my hands in the way, but I switched them. But this looks no different than what it originally did. So this would not be another distinguishable way of arranging these letters. Okay, so that's what it means. How many different ways can I arrange these letters? It says words. The words don't really matter. Like, for instance, if I wrote I M S S I S S I P P I, like this would be another way that I can arrange these letters that it looks different. I want to know how many different ways can I do that? Well, here's your formula. I figure out how many different letters there are total. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I lost track. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So on top, I'm going to put 11 factorial. So it's however many letters there are factorial. Now, I have to kind of get rid of the repeats. I have to divide out, you know, the times where I, I switched these two S's, but it doesn't look different. Well, here's what I do. I look for any letters that repeat. So look at the eyes. There's one, two, three, four eyes. So what I'm going to do is divide out four factorial in the denominator. Then I look at the S's. There's one, two, three, four S's. So in the denominator, I divide another four factorial. And then there's two P's. So two factorial. There's only one M. I mean, technically, you could put one factorial if you want, but that's just one. Then you just enter this in the calculator. When you enter it in the calculator, you need to be careful because you have to put this entire denominator in parentheses. 
to make sure you get the right answer. But you get 34,650. Alright, last permutation problem. From a pool of 12 candidates, we need to choose a president, vice president, secretary, and treasurer. How many different ways can those positions be filled? The hardest part for students is deciding does order matter or not. And anytime you're filling spots like first, second, or third, or you know, president, vice president, yada, yada, that's when the order matters. So we have a few different options we could do this problem. You know, think about how we did the whole horse problem up here. You could do, let's see, 12, and we're choosing to order one, two, three, four of them. So you could do 12 P4, and just enter that in your calculator, and that tells you the answer. You could, choose, you could think about it like you're filling in spaces, right? You have 12 different possibilities to be president. Well, someone's going to be president, which means now you have 11 possible options of vice president and then 10, and then 9. Multiply those together, and you get the same answer as this. Or you can do the formula approach and do 12 factorial divided by uh, n minus r, so 12 minus 4, so 8 factorial. So any one of these options is acceptable work, and then you just get the answer of 11,880. Right there. Okay, the last type is probably the easiest, but for some reason, students confuse combinations and, and permutations. Combinations are when the order doesn't matter. Now, what I mean is, you know, in the other problems, we had a first place, second place, third place. We had president, vice president, secretary, treasurer. So, like... If I had, let's say there was eight people. I'm going to try to give you guys my best visual in a quick amount of time. So let's say I had Joe, Jason, Sally, uh, Sarah, uh, Julie, and Frank. So I have six people, right? And let's say I'm going to just pick a president and vice president. So I have president, vice president. And I want to think, okay, how many different ways can I do this? Well, let's say that Sally is president. You don't have to write any of this. I just want you to watch. And let's say Jason is vice president. Well, that's one way that out of these six people, I can select a president and vice president, right? But what if Jason was the president and Sally was the vice president? Well, that's a second way. That's a second way out of these six people I can select a president and vice president. So I have two different options here. This is when the order matters. I can take the same two people, but if I put them in different spots, that's just another different possible outcome. I didn't have that being shown. So there's two ways there. Well, now, if I'm talking about a combination, and that means the order doesn't matter, okay? Here's, here's kind of what I mean by that. Let's say that out of these six students, let's say these are students, I'm going to pick my two favorite students to go get ice cream. Okay? doesn't matter who I pick first or second. I'm going to pick my two favorite students to go get ice cream. Well, that means if I pick Jason and Sally, or if I pick Sally and Jason, this is still just one way that out of these six people, I select my two favorite students. The order didn't matter. This just this is the same option. It was only one possible way when I have this. When the order mattered, this created two different possibilities. So that's what I mean by order matters versus doesn't matter. So it says from a group of 40 people, a jury of 12 is to be selected. It doesn't matter who's the first juror or second or third. There's 40 people. And it's basically, how many different ways can I just select 12 random subgroups of people? The order does not matter. And how many different ways can the jury be selected? Well, you know how we had the NPR? Well, now we just have NCR. And I like to think of that C, it stands for combination, but I remember my college professor would always use the word choose. If I have 40 people, how many ways can I choose 12 of them? And the order doesn't matter. I'm just choosing 12. So in my calculator, I would do 40C12, and it's going to give me the answer. It's going to tell me 
Ooh, that's a lot. Five, five, eight, six, eight, five, three, four, eight, zero. I don't even know what that number is. Five billion, five hundred eighty-six million, eight hundred fifty-three thousand, four hundred and eighty. That's a lot. Now, if the order mattered, think about this. If the order mattered, now for every one of those 12 people, I now have to think, okay, out of those 12 that I selected, now I'm going to arrange like all, how many ways can I arrange all 12 of those? There's always going to be more permutations when the order matters than combinations. I, I'm not going to do it in my calculator, but it's a giant number if the order actually mattered. You could use a formula. You're not going to have to ever do this, but I'll show you. So it's n factorial divided by n minus r factorial and then times r factorial. You're getting rid of all the like repeats, kind of like we did on when we arranged Mississippi. So in this problem, you could do 40 factorial divided by and then 40 minus 12 is 28 factorial and then times 12 factorial. Those of you that will get into math fields um, as you move on into college are going to see this stuff show up quite a bit. I don't know, in stats, you'll probably see it a little bit. Uh, if you end up taking a finite class your senior year, you might see some of this stuff as well. It's kind of an interesting bra branch of mathematics. The last one, you're forming a 12-member swim team from 10 girls and 15 boys. The team must consist of 5 girls and 7 boys. How many different 12-member teams are possible? Well, we're creating one team, but we're kind of thinking like it's two different teams. Like we have a girl team and we have a boy team that are forming one team. So we need to think how many different ways can we select the girls, right? If we have 10 girls and we need five of them, it's kind of like, well, if we have 10 girls, how many ways can we choose five of them? It doesn't matter who the first girl I select is or the second. I'm just picking five. And so that's how I know it's a combination. It'd be like 10 C5. This is how many different combinations I can make of girls' teams. Well, then I have to match every single one of these possibilities with all the possibilities of boys' teams I can create. 15 boys, I'm choosing 7 of them. And the way I, you know, figure how many ways can I match every one of these up with every one of these, I just multiply these numbers together. I don't know individually what these numbers are. Your calculator does it. But in general, it's 1,621,620. So as you practice, just kind of think, you know, am I, filling in, am I filling in spaces, like counting principle? Am I ordering things, like first, second, and third? Or am I just having a large group and I'm selecting a subgroup of them? That's kind of how you have to enter these problems. Let me know if you have any questions. Best of luck.